We're joined on MI Forum by Professor Hal Hill. Uh, professor Hill is a professor of Southeast Asian Studies at the Australian National University. So welcome, Hal. Thank you very forum. much for the invitation, Craig. It's, uh, it's good to be here. And I know that uh, through the years when I was studying for my PhD, we knew each other mm. in the early 80s. Mm. And even then, you were very heavily engaged mm. in one of those Southeast Asian countries, uh, Indonesia. Uh, I think you had a fair bit to do with the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies. Yes, I edited, edited it for a decade. For a decade. Yeah. And uh, also that you have had um, PhD students uh, and other students come through the mm. ANU mm. who you've supervised. Mm. Uh, they've gone on to um, high office. So I wonder if you could start by telling us why you became interested in Southeast Asian studies in Indonesia in particular, and what your bonds are with Indonesia based on that those early years. Well, thank you, thank you, Craig. Uh, for my generation, it was a very easy and obvious connection. Uh, I was part of the 1960s student generation, which became seriously interested in Southeast Asia, partly motivated by a our unhappiness with our involvement in the Vietnam War. Uh -huh. uh, and I happened to be a, an undergraduate master's student at Monash University, which was then the leading centre for work on Southeast Asia in Australia and maybe in the world. And so it was just a process of, of, gradual, of gradual involvement and osmosis. Uh, and once you start getting involved with Indonesia and mm. Southeast Asia more broadly, uh, it gets you and it doesn't let you go. And so I, I then uh, I took my PhD uh, in economics uh, in the department we were talking about yep. uh, under uh, Professor Heinz Arndt. Heinz Arndt, And yes. Heinz was the key figure in establishing Australia's international reputation for work on the Indonesian economy. Uh, and ever since, ever since then, uh, you know, I've, I've, it's been a, a hobby and a profession all in one. And I've had, had quite a lot of students, as you mentioned, and they are uh, very proud of them. Um, I don't claim a lot of credit, but they've done wonderful things. Who, for example, in the Indonesian government? I'm sort of reluctant to mention names, really, Craig, because I don't want to be. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to big note myself. Well, know. I'll big note you. <laughs> uh, I understand. I mean, the finance minister, Hadi Basri. I understand. A um, few others, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chadi Basri. Hadi Basri, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's. Was the investment coordinator? Well, uh, uh, Hadid was. Um, he finished his PhD in two thousand and one at a, at, in our department. Uh, then he went back to the University of Indonesia. Uh, he then joined the cabinet as head of the thing called the BKPM, the mm. Investment Coordinating yeah. Board. Uh, and from there, uh, he moved in to become. As finance. he is currently the finance minister. And that's the equivalent of our treasurer. That's right, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Because we a rather Australia, bigger portfolio than We treasury. have a finance minister and a yes, treasurer. That's right, um, yes. But yes. in most countries, yes. the finance minister is the treasurer. That's right, yes. It, it's a rather large department, actually. Mm. Uh, it has 62,000 employees. And so. were you not his supervisor? I, I was indeed. He was one of our best students. Right. Yes. And what Pleasure about um, Mari Pangestu? Well, Mari did her PhD. Uh, did her master's, did her undergraduate and master's at ANU. Yeah. She was actually supervised by Peter Drysdale. Okay. Because yeah. I, I got to know her but in the 1970s. Her, yeah. and, and, and fortunately, um, the current vice president, uh, Bodiono. Uh, Dr. Budiono, who just received an honorary doctorate from ANU, ANU. Yeah. Uh, he's not formally a graduate of the ANU, unless you count the, the honorary doctorate. But he was for two years uh, a junior staff member in our department right. uh, and has generously acknowledged that uh, involvement is helping him in, in his career professionally. Uh, and then when he was doing his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, he actually spent a year again in our department, mm -hmm. which was when I was also writing up. So okay. we're sort of colleagues, uh, yeah. I guess you could say. So there's three cabinet ministers, uh, the vice president, uh, the treasurer, otherwise known as mm. the Finance Minister, and the Minister for the Knowledge, I think it's the Knowledge it's Economy, tourism, Creative, creative Economy. economy and, but her creative major contribution and, was, of course, the Trade Minister. We were in, uh, There's was, another uh, senior minister in mm. Indonesia mm. who I think is not so much affiliated with the ANU, but with an Australian university, and that's Marty Natalagawa. Well, well, he actually got his PhD from ANU. Well, there you go. There's in another. international relations. I, I, I didn't really know him when he was yeah. a PhD student, but he's a PhD from the ANU. So I think ANU, you know, has made that long-term big investment mm. in Southeast Asia, and 
I think we're seeing the, the benefits. And so four it. cabinet ministers mm. have gone through, mm. uh, in one way or another, the ANU. Yes, that's right. So it does give you uh, some uh, claim to knowledge about Indonesia, but your knowledge hasn't really drawn just from the, the contact you've had with them, but a deep and prolonged study into the nation called Indonesia. Yes. How did a collection of 17,300 mm. islands mm. Depending, become, on the, depending on the sea level. Yeah, <laughs> some come and go. <laughs> a, a, a few more, more might go than come. That's right, exactly. Yes, yeah, that's right. Unfortunately. Yes. But how did a nation of more than 17,000 mm. islands, mm. give or take 300, mm. become a nation? Well, uh, as with, as with the, all countries post-colonial, uh, the post-colonial era, these were sort of maps drawn arbitrarily, lines on maps drawn arbitrarily by the colonial powers in Europe. And so Indonesia, in a sense, is sort of an accident of history. Mm -hmm. um, it's got huge diversity. Uh, it could just as easily have become several states rather than one state, or yeah. it could have had borders which transcend the current borders. Um, I guess you would say that the founding father of Indonesia was, of course, President Sukarno, the first yes. president for, for 20 years. And it was that leadership group uh, in the early part of the 20th century which forged the nationalist movement, the anti-colonial, anti-Dutch movement, which eventually, uh, as an accident in a sense or byproduct of World War II, as Japan was retreating um, in August 1945, yes. uh, it, it in a sense persuaded the Indonesian leadership to declare independence. And this uh, was the time to move. And yes, did the uh, Dutch come back after They the did war? indeed, yes. Mm. So the Dutch came back and there was a, a bitter a bit of post-1945 war, which proceeded essentially till 1949. Wow. And so Indonesia became an independent nation state in 1945, but in a sense, peace didn't really, uh, didn't, wasn't restored until 1949. And, some of and the... there were boundary changes since, of course, right. I mean, part of what's now called Papua remained as, as a Dutch colony uh, and, until the 1960s. So that's now called, uh, what, Irian Jaya? It's or? now called Papua. Is it? Yes, yeah, okay. yes. That's, yeah, right. that's the, the other half of the island of New Guinea. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so uh, I just think this is fascinating in its own right. Mm. Um, when I went to APEC for the trade ministers meeting mm. earlier this year, we mm. went to a city called Surabaya, mm. a mere 10 million people. That's right. Uh, that I'd never visited before, but it was uh, very much in the middle of the struggle for independence, I understand. Yes, well, uh, when, the, when the Dutch, in a sense, retook uh, the capital, Jakarta, then called Batavia, uh, the Republican forces retreated, and so the, the capital became Jogjakarta, the famous university city mm. in central Java, and Surabaya, which was, has always been the major commercial city, was also... A, a part of the struggle and the intense yeah. battles between the Dutch and the nationalist forces. So now, you were saying that the... Incendios, if I could just yeah. butt in. Um, you mentioned Surabaya as 10 million people. Uh, Greater Jakarta, the capital, mm. has uh, over 20 million people. Yeah. So a handy way for an Australian uh, audience to think about it is it's the population of Australia. Yeah, mm. amazing, really. And um, we think China's bigger than it is, mm. but on our doorstep mm. as a nation of 245 million people yes. whose capital has almost as many people in it as Australia yes, as right. on its continent. Yes. Incidentally, uh, while we're on statistics, a statistic which sometimes uh, puzzles people is that there are, there are more Christians in Indonesia than there are in Australia. Wow. Uh, and that's a Dutch Christian heritage? Or? Yes, and you know, the ethnic Chinese community right. as well. It's mm -hmm. quite broad-based. And so even though Indonesia has the largest number of adherents to Islam in mm. the world, yeah. although, although it's not an Islamic state, important distinction, yeah. it actually has more Christians. And we'll come back to that because it mm. is an important um, point. So Indonesia is formed as a nation after independence or upon independence, but... Uh, you mentioned President Sukarno. He was the head of a military regime, uh, but gradually or uh, sharply over time, democracy 
broke out? How did that yes, happen? I wouldn't really call him the head of a military regime, Craig. He was really the nationalist leader, right. and he was balancing a lot of forces in, in the... Apologies yeah, yeah. to President yeah, Sukarno. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... that's uh, I mean, he was close to the military when he had to be, but mm. he certainly was an independent figure. And, and so I think if you're looking at history to understand current Indonesia, you've got to remember th uh, three dates, 1945, 1966, and 1998. And uh, so for the first, for the first uh, two thirds of the 20th century, Indonesia's economy was more or less declining most of the time. Mm -hmm. There's been these pioneering estimates by a colleague at ANU, Pia van der Eng, who's computed the national accounts for Indonesia in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in 1965, when you had to change from Sukarno to Suharto, uh, he estimates per capita income as being about about three quarters of what it was early in the 20th century. So the place got poorer, mm, that's population right. growth, yes. and, and, it and got of course there was, there was the great the Great Depression and war yeah. for independence. But in general, the economy was declining. And 1966 well. is a big date. What a, happened then? A big, well, that was so that was uh, Sukarno in his later years um, um, really wasn't very interested in economic management. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, uh, he was balancing uh, the forces, in a sense, the Islamic forces, the communist forces. Indonesia had the largest communist party in the world in the early 1960s. Uh, he disengaged from the, global, uh, from the global community. He'd withdrawn from the United Nations, the World Bank and mm -hmm. others. Right. He was part of the, what was then called the Pyongyang, uh, Beijing, uh, Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Jakarta axis of newly emerging forces. Right. So the economy was increasingly shambolic. There was hyperinflation. The printing presses broke down. They were trying to print so much so money. Much money. Uh, and there was a tension between the communist and the anti-communist forces, which culminated on the 30th of September with a, still a, a contested a, a contested occurrence, but it seems to be uh, some young left-leaning military officers tried to seize power and were unsuccessful. Uh, in the process that they killed several of the generals, generals thinking yeah. that they would actually be the, their obstacle. And they missed out on the key one. And that was Suharto, who mm -hmm. was a senior general at the time as well. Yeah. And over the next year or so, he, he gradually uh, asserted authority and took power from Sukarno. Yeah. So this then, would I, would I be inaccurate in saying this was a military regime that took over? It that, certainly was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Suharto was military guy, Sukarno not really... But now we've got a military regime. In That's Indonesia. right, and this ushers in a, 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 an amazing period in the country's history—a controversial period because, on the one hand, Suharto was a president for 32 years who emphasised economic development. Um, the economy was really written off in the mid 1960s. Um, the famous book on internet on development economics in general by. Professor Benjamin Higgins, who spent his last 15 years uh, at the ANU, incidentally, mm -hmm. he called Indonesia a chronic economic dropout. Right. Uh, the famous book by Gunnar Merdal, Asian drama, said Indonesia had no prospect for, mm -hmm. for development. Okay. So there had been this long-term economic decline, which these famous people had observed. What they didn't see was, in fact, under Suharto, uh, income per capita quadrupled in the next 30 years. So you see an amazing about turn in the country's economic fortunes, uh, accompanied by a period of authoritarian rule, so yeah. and, and and major infringements on human rights. Um, you know, a lot of people yeah. were killed during that 65, 66 period in particular. Yes. So Suharto, um, notwithstanding these other mm. very real mm. problems and mm. legacies, did get the economy going. You say? Yes, that's right. That, that was th this was the first period of modern economic growth. Yes in Indonesia uh, in the mid-1960s, for what the data are worth, Indonesia was probably amongst the 10 poorest countries mm. in the world. Uh, and now, of course, we know it's a middle-income developing uh, and, country. So uh, remarkable transformation. Leaping forward, I've seen figures about, or projections, mm. about, um, you say Indonesia was at that time amongst the 10 poorest countries in the world. There are projections that are not way out mm. that suggest by 2030 it could be uh, one of the 10 biggest economies, not the 10 richest, yes. but the 10 biggest ten economies. 10 largest, that's right. Uh, so on current projections, it'll happen by then, maybe a bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, so in the next decade plus, we're, we're, going to, we're going to be living with a country which will be in the top 10. And then and it'll be larger than us, of course. Fast too. forward from 1966 to 1998, mm. democracy. Mm. Um, 
uh, blossoms in yes. Indonesia. How did that happen? Well, so the, the, the background was Suharto was, um, uh, was a president who delivered on economic development, uh, but he was an authoritarian leader, yeah. and authoritarian leaders don't like to have uh, alternative leaders in the wings. And so he deliberately, uh, deliberately pushed aside all potential uh, rivals and threats. Uh, initially, he was very much of the military. Later on, he became more important than the military. Uh, and in the last decade, his power base really had shifted and was increasingly focused on the business enterprises of his children, who became, right. in a sense, among the major conglomerates in the country. Now, uh, by the mid-1990s, he had pushed aside his so-called technocrats, the economic advisors who had been crucial in guiding to, to the economy of from prosperity. the mid-1960s. So they were called the, the Berkeley Mafia. Mm -hmm. A lot of them graduated from Berkeley. We're trying to replace them, by the way, with the, with the <laughs> well, ANU Mafia. The ANU Mafia. <laughs> uh, so, much more benign <laughs> and, and enlightened Mafia. I, I hope so. Yeah. Although the Berkeley Mafia were pretty good too. Yeah. Um, so uh, he pushed aside the economic advisors by the early 1990s, by and large. Uh, and this was also a time when global capital markets were changing. Uh, Indonesia had always had an open capital account since the early 1970s on the, uh, on the presumption that uh, the previous closed multiple foreign exchange regime, regime collapsed because of corruption and just maladministration. They opened the capital account. Initially, that What's was, that involved? What, how do you open a capital basically account? I know how to open a bank account, <laughs> but it sounds weird. Right, so it basically means that there are virtually no restrictions on international capital flows right. inward and outward. Okay. So the country was really bankrupt and desperate to attract capital in the late 60s. The, the argument was, if we want capital to come in, we've got to give the assurance that it can go out. Yes. Um, so that was fine for, for, for the 70s and 80s. By the 90s, as we know, global capital markets were changing. In particular, the, the, there was a lot of what's now referred to often as mobile capital, short-term mm. capital movement. And there's hedge funds, that they come hedge into funds, that? Hedge funds, hedge yeah. funds. And general general integration within capital markets. Feel free to have a I, I might gulp of water. Thanks, yeah, and so by the 1990s, you had this build up of a lot of short term debt and a lot of capital mobility going in and out of the system. Yeah. And at the time, it looked like Indonesia was managing it quite well. There were no mm. obvious signs of a crisis being imminent. But uh, it turned out uh, on July the second, 1997 when the Thai baht collapsed. The Thailand had had a, the beginnings of a crisis in the early 1997 period. Capital started exiting very quickly. The Bank of Thailand tried to hang on to the exchange rate. In the end, it ran out of foreign exchange reserves and it couldn't. So the Thai baht collapsed and the contagion spread surprisingly quickly from Thailand throughout the region. Mm -hmm. And Indonesia in particular copped it. So, so people thought all of these Asian economies are risky. Is that that's this right. is what if, contagion really means? That's right. That, if the that, policy settings are... Well, first of all, you know, we know that capital markets are often are very whimsical and yeah. don't understand countries. So, first of all, I think it was just a geographic association. Yeah. As much Which as happened else. in Latin America. That's uh, right. That earlier. That that's right. Any yes. country that happened to be in Latin America, that's right. money Copy. just poured out that's of That's right, yes. And so uh, then, but then capital markets started looking at the so-called vulnerability indicator, mm. the vulnerability to a crisis. And the more they looked at it, Indonesia looked a bit like Thailand, Thailand. as did Malaysia too. Uh, and so from about the second half of 1997, Indonesia uh, was subject to the, this sort of capital flight and, and international risk perceptions. And from seemingly an impregnable position of power in the mid-1990s, uh, so the Suharto regime um, collapsed amazingly quickly. Right. Um, there's a lot of debate about the events of 1997-98. In the end, Suharto stepped down voluntarily, actually, mm. in May 1998. There's a lot of debate about whether the IMF was the bait noir or whether it was domestic policy mistakes. Yeah. So, so that, the IMF gave a big thumbs down, didn't they, to that's right, the Indonesian yes. economy? And didn't they... Tell me, this could be wrong, and I'm quite happy to embarrass myself on MO Forum <laughs> by saying things that are wrong and having I'm, them I'm sure you guess corrected by learned <laughs> uh, people. But did the IMF um, recommend austerity measures mm. that, that um, in order to give confidence back to the foreign exchange markets that have to cut government spending, increase taxes, that sort of yes. thing? Yes. 
Yes, no, essentially, I think the IMF misdiagnosed the crisis. Mm. It came in with a, a, a sort of medicine which was more suited to the Latin American economies, yeah. the ones you mentioned earlier, which yeah. had had crises originating in fiscal, fiscal problems. Because their budgets Exchange were rates. out of control, mm. but Indonesia wasn't Yeah, and that, that classic Latin American stereotype, fixed exchange rate, large fiscal deficit, mm. being monetized, higher inflation, and then loss of competitiveness yeah. in the exchange okay. rate. So, so Indonesia didn't have those problems, nor did Thailand either. Mm. But I think the IMF used this opportunity. They, the IMF had, had become unimportant in Indonesia for the decade prior to the Asian financial crisis. I think the IMF now saw itself as being the central player in the resolution of the crisis. Mm. But I, I think arguably it didn't really have the right sort of analytical policies. tools and policies, yeah. therefore. Okay. But, so, so, but moving on from that period, uh, and of course Indonesia itself made serious policy mistakes as well, especially Suharto. And towards the end of his regime, the, the corruption children centred yeah. had become so very rampant. bad. Eh? Mm. So he'd lost a lot of the the goodwill which he'd had for a long time yeah. from you know the really genuine because development because they were getting economic growth and development going that's there. right so uh, so, so that's when you get a democracy, to democracy so it yeah. actually became it mm. could have switched to someone else mm. i suppose but it didn't it became a democracy mm. we're going to need to fast forward in a moment mm. but um, there have been a number of presidents in that relatively short period since 1998 mm. um, but um, President Cecilio Bang Bang Uniono mm. has been there for quite some time now. Mm, that's right. But he yes. finishes up next year because he, finishes he has next to. Year, that's right. Yes, mm. he's a constitutional limit of two terms of five years each. Just one point which is worth mentioning, Craig, on 98, uh, which often isn't appreciated. Uh, things look really bad in 98, again, like 1965, 66, when people wrote off Indonesia. That's a history of people writing off Indonesia. Yeah which is really important to understand. Mm. So in 98, things looked really bad. There were these rather serious ethnic disputes yeah. involving the ethnic Chinese, Chinese community, versus, which are the dominant business group. Um, yeah, and, and, and ethnic and, and Indonesian. Indigenous yeah. groups all around the place. Timor became an issue. The Timor mm -hmm. had become part of Indonesia, yeah. controversially in 1975. Uh, and, and the exchange rate had collapsed. The exchange mm. rate had gone from 2,500 rupiah to the dollar to 17,500. Right. So, for an Australian audience, you know, imagine the Australian dollar going from parity with the US to about 15 mm. cents. Or for an Australian tourist, that's heaven, isn't it? That's right, yes, that's <laughs> right. Going to Bali. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the financial sector had collapsed. Mm. And the key thing was there wasn't any sort of institutional mechanism for succession. And so, you know, Indonesia, there were lots of scenarios then. The most common scenario was kind of a scenario like what appears to be unfolding in Egypt today, where there'd be this long period of stalemate uh, with, you know, with rather nasty consequences, both socially, politically and mm. economically. The fact that Indonesia came through that period is now the world's third most populous democracy and a democracy which kind of works. I mean, mm. they've now had three elections. And they've got uh, provincial governments. So they've, now got, yeah. they've now got 500 and, and counting, 530 sub-national tiers of government, that is provinces and below the provinces, yeah. Kabupaten. They all have directly elected heads and directly elected assemblies. And so this is a highly political, uh, sorry, a highly democratic pluralistic system. Mm. It's also, that's very relevant for us understanding in the yeah, future, because, because of this pluralism. I mean, it's fascinating that that came so suddenly. Often there's a transition that's from right. a, a, let's say, a military regime and a, bit, a relaxation bit by bit. For example, in Burma, yes, um, this right. one was just cold turkey. That's right. End, the, of, end of military regime. Mm -hmm. And then at least all the structures of a parliamentary democracy. Yes, I suppose the closest analogy in our neighbourhood is the Philippines after 1986. Uh, Marcos and Suarez were different kind of people, yeah. but, but um, it is striking if you compare the Philippines and Indonesia, where they had this deep economic crisis and political crisis, mm. economies contracting by 15% of GDP yeah. in one year, for example, both of them. Uh, in Indonesia, it took Indonesia seven years to get back to the pre-crisis level of per capita yeah. income in 1997. It took the Philippines 20 years mm. to get back. Mm. And that's more or less, that's a more general guide to yeah. when you get these twin economic and political crises. So in that sense, Indonesia's recovery post-1998 has been quite remarkable. And Indonesia's been growing very strongly. And I know from talking to my friends, such as uh, Mari Pangestu and mm. Gita, Gita Wirawan, their mm. trade minister, that there's a very strong emphasis on development. Mm. That is, it's not just growth for growth's sake, mm. but 
the entire mm. um, area of Indonesia, all the provinces mm. shall benefit from mm. this growth. Mm. Uh, but the growth has been quite phenomenal in the last few years. As yes, I yes. No, it has been. Uh, Indonesia has been growing at about six, six and a half percent uh, since around 2000, since the crisis. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty decent rate yeah. of growth. It, it's never been as high as the the real star economies of uh, Asia, that is China, China and, and the four Asian NIEs, you know, yeah. the Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong earlier. But it's been it's been in the top 10 percent of developing countries in terms yeah. of economic performance. And that's a remarkable achievement. Yeah. So it brings us to the present. What do Indonesians, who do they think about beyond the boundaries of Indonesia? And we had a discussion off camera and you were saying that uh, Professor Heinz Arndt, mm. who established, the, or in whose name the school was, um, that your professor of was mm. established, was saying that both countries look north. Mm. Australia looks north to Indonesia mm. and Indonesia looks north, mm. not particularly south to mm. Australia. Can mm. you just explain that? So uh, I think Heinz's point is very important. So um, we look north and they look north. So when we look north, we see Indonesia yeah. immediately. When they look north, of course, they don't see us. Uh, so an Indonesian view of the world would be to say, um, first of all, ASEAN is important for Indonesia, despite all the kind of, you know, the frustration yeah. with the pace of movement in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It is the centre stone of their foreign economic so uh, countries such policy. as Malaysia, the countries, um, Thailand, mm. like the original ASEAN, yes. Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines. That's right. Yes. So the um, ten countries of Southeast Singapore, Asia, of course, Singapore, yes. and now increasingly we've got countries like Vietnam, yeah. Cambodia, Laos, and um, Myanmar. That's right. Burma That's in, right. In so uh, so ASEAN is important, um, and people often don't appreciate its importance. I mean, it is six hundred and twenty million people, ten yeah. nation states. It's the most durable regional association in the developing world. It's been going since 1967. Although it's sometimes rather slow moving, it is central to understanding, by and large, the harmony which has existed in Southeast yeah. Asia over the past 30 years. Is there any role for the ethnic Chinese community in that? Because there's an ethnic Chinese community, obviously, in Singapore. Yes. There's one in Malaysia. There's one in Thailand. Is that relevant or is it just more because they're near neighbours? Well, uh, Southeast Asia, of course, is characterised by ethnic diversity, and mm. that reflects the, the, the flows of migration over the yeah, centuries. centuries yeah. And it is certainly the case that a lot of the modern sector throughout the region is, is dominated by the ethnic Chinese community. Um, in, in, and they, their importance varies across countries, from being dominant, of course, in Singapore, to being very important in uh, in Malaysia, but to being significant in Indonesia. In Indonesia, they're only about 3% of the population, but they are key players throughout the modern sector of the economy. Yeah. That, by the way, is, a, is always an issue of you know, some contention in yeah, the country. Sure. Um, yeah. Malaysia formally has affirmative action between ethnic groups. Yeah. Indonesia has it informally, sort of because of the large gap in so living standards. When they're looking north, do mm. they look, do Indonesians look north beyond Thailand to China? Yes. So, of course, uh, coming back to the, the big story, uh, apart from ASEAN, traditionally it's really been Japan and the US. I mean, yeah. during the Suharto period, Japan uh, and US were the major investors. No, they were the yeah, major investing heavily in. Major investors, major yeah. donors, major traders. Yeah. Japan relationship, very important uh, because uh, in a sense, Japan, Indonesia opened up when Japan was opening up as a major outward investor. Yeah, because in Japan 60s. was shedding some of the industry. Exactly. So um, there was a complementarity. That it was looking for to yes. other countries to host. That's right. Such as mineral processing. It, exactly. That's right. And so, and also the resource security issue became very important yeah. in Japan. In so the they wanted Saudis. access to maybe coal from Kalimantan. Yes. Places. And also, also the oil imports came through the Malacca Straits. Yeah. The Malacca Straits, very narrow coastal. Yeah, it's a yeah. real choke point. And Indonesia itself was a big oil producer. Yes, that's right. It was then. It's not mm, now. Not now. Yeah. And so then it was Japan and, um, and the US, with, yeah. of course, Europe being important, sure. uh, although not as important. Um, the big story, of course, uh, over the past 20 years has been the rise of China. 
And now China-Indonesia diplomatic relations were in the deep freeze after 1966. Yeah. You know, Suharto, very anti-communist, mm. um, and suspected China of being involved in the events yes. of 65, 66. But uh, since the early 1990s, when diplomatic relations have been restored, uh, that's been a real growth story. And the two economies, a bit like China and Australia, uh, the two economies are highly complementary. Yeah. And indeed, um, Indonesia has a free trade agreement with China. Yes, um, that's right. Part, part of the China, the CAFTA, the China ASEAN Free Trade yeah, Agreement. Yes, yeah. yes. That's so right. um, that's yeah, a major investor. That's as well. occurred, and also um, Indonesia, amongst the other ASEANs, has kicked off negotiations for a big regional trade grouping called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. That's right. ASEP. You've got to yes. have acronyms. That's right. That's uh, right. And Australia's yeah. in that. Yes. So, but if Indonesia is looking north, do we as Australians have assumptions about Indonesia and its relationship to Australia that are wrong? Well, I think there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding uh, of Indonesia and Australia. Um, I mean, the obvious point is we're 1.4 percent of the global economy. Uh, we're probably about we're probably about three or four percent of Indonesia's trade and investment pattern. So we're mm. more than our global share, but we're still small, really small. And so I think to be to be Factored into Indonesia's calculations about our relative importance, we have to be good at something. Mm. So Indonesians will not naturally look at us. They'll only look at us in a sense when we're kind of important to them. Yeah. And so that's happened in a few cases, not many, but a few. The principal case has been education. So Australia for quite a long time has been the largest offshore supplier of tertiary education. So a favoured destination for yes. Indonesia. And that was really just, in a sense, a convenience factor. We're close, and when our dollar was a good deal weaker, we yeah. were relatively cheap. Yeah. And so, um, and that wasn't, in a sense... And a, good experiences at the ANU as well. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so, yeah. So, well, there have been two parts to it. One is the undergraduate uh, yeah. student numbers. That's the big group. Yeah, yeah. And that's essentially a commercial transaction. It's full fee yeah. paying students. And then the graduate part has a lot of that has been funded through uh, what was then called AusAid, yeah. now part of DFAT, with a fairly generous scholarship scheme. Right. And so there have been two parts, and they have different implications. Yeah. One essentially commercially driven mm. are the undergraduates, and one with a much more yeah. sort of broader So there's objective. one the education. Mm. Education being important. Live cattle has played some role so, more recently. Yeah, so agriculture is obviously a, 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 an important area, as you, as you would know. Mm. Um, Indonesia's always been ambivalent about agricultural trade. Um, it's, it's wavered between being open and being protectionist. Yeah. Uh, in the post uh, Suharto democratic era, the agriculture ministry, as you, <laughs> I'm sure you'd know, has, in, has been controlled by a particular political party, a party called PKS, yes. which has become blatantly protectionist. Mm. So we, we've got an issue with agriculture. Well, can you uh, just uh, explain is that why does that political party get the agriculture, of course, the National Party in Australia always gets gets yes. agriculture. Yes. Is it the same? Not thing? really, not really, Craig. It's really just it, well to go back a step. Indonesia's uh, are now a highly pluralistic uh, sort of political entity. Um, the president is directly elected, <clears throat> but the president's party does not have a majority in, in the, the DPR, the parliament. Yeah, and therefore he has to form what's called the Rainbow Coalition, which yeah. is... A and this is almost moment. inevitable, isn't That's it? That's right, yes. Yeah. Almost certainly will continue with the next next yeah. president next year. And therefore, there's a division of portfolios amongst the coalition partners. The good thing about the system to date is that certain uh, portfolios have been considered sort of off-limits to politics, so the finance ministry, mm. the treasury, uh, the trade ministry sometimes, not mm. always, foreign ministry, and of course the central bank's independent. Yeah, sure. But the rest of the, the rest of the ministry is sort of carved up on political grounds, and so this particular party has got um, agriculture for, for the past decade at least. Right, yeah. okay. So, is that inevitable um, in the future? No, it's not, mm. no. Okay. It's, it's just in this particular party, which was very popular, is now becoming unpopular, so right. we don't know. Yeah. But agriculture is obviously going to be important, but uh, it, it is the, the Indonesian view of it's, you know, pressures for self-sufficiency and so mm. on is going to colour it. Yeah. So apart from educa education and agriculture, the other obvious big area is mining. 
Mm. Uh, and so that's where we have, uh, we're both competitors because we're both exporters, yeah. but we're also complementary because, you know, we have some of the skills which... Yeah, so they utilise the skills mm. of some of our big mining yes. companies. Yes, and, yeah. and that's important. I think that sector in understanding Australian business views of Indonesia, uh, the mining sector since 1998 has become a real political football in Indonesia. You might say it's been in Australia as yeah. well, but, but much more so in Indonesia. So under Suharto, the mining regulations were very clear, very predictable, uh, and, and the, the business environment was very, was very secure. Since 1998, uh, it's become very insecure. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our majors, you know, the BHPs and, uh, and, and Rio Tintos, uh, actually left Indonesia. Right in the late 1990s, they had their fingers badly burnt. And so because they were the major Australian investors in Indonesia for a long time, that has somewhat soured the business perceptions of Indonesia, okay. at least in, in the decade after 1998. Maybe it's yeah. changing now. Okay. So uh, to, sum, to summarise so far, Indonesia looking north but south on two or three um, parts mm. of their kind of commercial relationship, mm. education, bit of agriculture, mm. some mining. Lots of other business services too. Yeah, for example. yeah. And of course the banks are now quite important, yeah, Australian sure. banks, yeah. Commonwealth Bank and but, ANZ, um, Ramsey, the healthcare provider, so there are these other Would firms. I be uh, right in saying that the Australian people's assumption is that Indonesia needs Australia and that that assumption is wrong? Yes, I think it is wrong. Um, and this is a sort of diplomatic issue of who needs who most mm. and uh, you know I, I won't try and be the judge of that but if you had to make an assumption it would be that Australia needs Indonesia more than Indonesia it needs Australia. Uh, I think actually in the G20 group Jakarta is the only capital where we're likely to be listened to seriously. I mean we'll be listened to in Washington, Tokyo and London but seriously mm -hmm. and I think so I think Jakarta is important. Uh, it's also important because I think the region will judge us partly on our relationship with Indonesia. Indonesia yeah. is the dominant power in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN. Yeah. ASEAN, in a sense, is the balance of power between China and Japan because they don't get along very well, mm -hmm. uh, and with India. Uh, and so I think how our relationship is established with Indonesia matters not just bilaterally, but yeah, also but regionally. but to the other mm. ASEANs. That's right, yes. So we seem to have an assumption and... Um, oh, sorry, Greg, just to, if I may interrupt you. There's sometimes an assumption that because we're, Indonesia's our largest aid recipient, yeah. uh, which it is now, it's overtaken mm. Papua New Guinea, uh, that therefore we have leverage. That uh, they need our aid. Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think it's wonderful. We are a, 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 an aid donor and contributor to Indonesia, but uh, it's, it's a mistaken assumption to think we can leverage a lot off yeah. that. Um, aid in the Indonesian economy is very small. It's mm -hmm. about 0.3% of their economy, mm. and wow. we are less than 10% of that 0.3. Okay. So we're point oh oh three something like something probably like a bit that. less actually. Yeah. So so the assumption that you know we have leverage from aid. And if they don't do so. what we say, we might withdraw. That's our right. Aid. Yes. It yes. would be um, yes. not of great significance. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I, I want to get on to one or two controversial mm. issues, but within this mm. overall um, reality that mm. you've helped create for uh, the viewers of mm. MA Forum. I don't want to dwell on asylum seekers, mm. but I think it's worth touching on it. Mm. Um, again, it seems that there is an assumption that there is an obligation on Indonesia to stop the flow of asylum seekers through Indonesia to Australia. Mm. Is that, would you agree with that? And if you don't, please be feel free to say, and if there is such an assumption, where's it come from? Uh, for Indonesia, the issue of um, what you might call irreg irregular mm. people movements is not a big deal. Yeah. Um, in most of Southeast Asia, international borders are very porous. People move across them quite a lot. Uh, currently, for example, uh, about 30% of the Malaysian workforce is f foreign workers. Mm -hmm. the, biggest uh, the biggest share of that is Indonesia. Indonesian workers in Malaysia. Right. There are estimated to be about 3 million Indonesian workers in Malaysia, a large share of their workforce, mm. and at least a million of those 3 million are estimated to be illegal yeah. or irregular. Yeah. So, you know, because, you know, the you just, they're close, they jump on, on a boat, boat, same language, yeah. um, uh, ethnic familiarity and so on. So 
uh, when you've got this kind of scale of movement, um, a few boats coming mm. through the archipelago yeah. on the way to Australia, I'm, I'm simplifying, yeah. it's really not a big deal. And Indonesians, our friends included, are sometimes genuinely puzzled. Why do we get so upset about a few boats arriving? I'm putting, I'm, I'm simplifying. Yeah, Why but do you're we get looking so... at from the point of view of Indonesia. Yes, I'm trying to give a view from Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, we, are, we Australia, are obviously very rich compared to them, and we're empty compared to them. Why would a few... Plenty of room. Yeah, and, you know, we've been, we're, they know we're a country built on migration. Yeah. What's the big deal? Yeah. And that, from an Australian point of view... I don't want to labour the point, but we seem to think that Indonesia has some sort of obligation yes. to Australia yes. to stop the boats. Yes, and, and they really are involved only out of courtesy to us, right. you know, frankly, yeah. to, do the, yeah. to do the... I mean, for, for them, I suppose, you could argue it's a bit of an embarrassment. Well, it is an embarrassment to have these terrible maritime accidents, of yes. course, but, but, you know, for them, it's not a big deal at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so and that, Indonesia, by the way, is not a signatory to the protocols anyway. The, the uh, refugee convention, yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and there so is there's not a formal it. obligation created That's right. by being yes. a signatory. And, and there is a that. debate in Indonesia about whether it ought to be, mm. and so in a way, we've got an interest in that debate. And so yeah. some of the more enlightened uh, in the academic community are saying Indonesia should be a signatory yeah. to it, and that would be an important uh, achievement for yeah. us. And I suppose the last point on this is. Um, I fully understand your point about Indonesians uh, travelling to other parts of the region on short boat trips, which they've done for centuries. That's right, right? exactly. Yeah. But these uh, asylum seekers aren't from, you know, just around mm. the next door neighbourhood. They're right. from the Middle East, yep. from um, Afghanistan Sri and so on. Does that, from Iran? Yes. Uh, in, yes. In, well, I was going to say yeah. increasingly, but yes. certainly in yes. substantial numbers. Does that change anything in terms of Indonesian thinking? Not really. No. Um, not really, no. It's a country with very porous international yeah. boundaries. And so they're not thing. shocked if they see an Iranian wandering around no. or a, a Hazara from, no. not, from um, Afghanistan. Not really, yeah. no. Yeah. No, you know, it's, it's a... 250 million people and, you know, it's ethnically diverse. Yeah. Not a big deal, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just wanted to then traverse, uh, you know, there's a current controversy mm. and, uh, again, I don't want to get into any detail about mm. that, but <clears throat> what is the um, uh, value or importance of us maintaining good, friendly relations with Indonesia? What does it matter? I mean, if Indonesia is looking north, in effect, minding its own business, and we're looking north beyond Indonesia, how important is it to have a very, you know, courteous, civil, even warm and friendly relationship well, with well, Indonesia? Well, in the early 1990s, I co-authored a report for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and it was on Australia and Southeast Asia. And so we, sub we subtitled it, from, from the tyranny of distance to the advantage of proximity. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, here we are. Historically, we've been isolated from the major centres of world economic activity. And now, in the last 20 years, and this is Asian century, which mm -hmm. of course you've been involved with a lot, here we are with this dynamic neighbourhood right on our doorstep. Yeah. If we can't grasp that opportunity, mm. uh, then, uh, then Australia doesn't have a great economic future. If we can't manage a productive commercial relationship and a political relationship mm. underpinning it yeah. with the most important country in Southeast Asia, yeah. which will become a major economic power, you know, in our lifetime, or yeah. at least in your lifetime. Shared <laughs> lifetime. I'm very confident about you. <laughs> then, then, you know, we, we're, we're going to miss the boat. Yeah. Um, and so that's the broad picture. Yeah. And, and, and I think it behoves all of us, you know, in government, in, in universities, in schools, and certainly in business, to have a longer time horizon. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We, we trade intensively with our, with our neighbourhood, but we don't invest much in it. No. Uh, I think so. I worry that Australian companies, with lots of important exceptions, just aren't taking uh, yeah. Indonesia seriously. And they've been taking, doing the long-term thinking about okay, it. Okay, to then challenge that proposition, you said in the recent past, a bit of interest in mining, a bit of interest in agriculture, um, quite a bit of interest in education. Um, it's not, doesn't amount to much, is, but is there an assumption that that would be the only areas of interest between the two countries in the future, or will is there potential for this relationship to flourish and broaden? Well, 
oh, I think the opportunities are everywhere. Almost mm. every activity you can think of in Indonesia, there, there would be an opportunity for, for Australia. Australia. I, mean, yeah. I mean, we do have the skills and the institutions yeah. to be able to contribute something. And we have this important attribute, which is this large alumni population yeah. in Indonesia who know us well and can be a bridge between yeah. us. I'm a bit embarrassed to be asking the question, actually, but I thought <laughs> I should, because 245 million people um, set to become in, you know, living uh, in, in most people's lives, mm. one of the top 10 countries, mm. uh, economies of the world. And I'm asking you whether it's important. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> I think I know the answer. Yeah, but it is important because, I mean, it's still a very poor country. Mm. So people, you know, might go to Indonesia and think this is a really poor country. Where are the opportunities? Mm. I mean, you've got to have this long-term perspective and both looking back and looking forward, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Indonesia on projections will eventually become as rich as Singapore, for example. Mm, yeah. And we, we know how wealthy that is. Yeah. Uh, and so finally, um, the white paper on Australia and the Asian century does actually look to other opportunities. Primarily, um, the thinking comes from the, the opportunities with China in some senses. So let me elaborate on that. Yes, Indonesia is poor, but it's going to have a very big middle class that it just gets wealthier and wealthier as well. Mm. And they'll be looking for premium, high quality products, mm. not just grains and mm. so on. This is right up Australia's alley mm. in the 21st century, mm. you'd mm. think. So Absolutely. a massive market for yes. our dairy products, yeah. for our, um, certainly for our, you mm. know, a, a whole lot of premium yeah. agricultural Food, products. Yeah, yeah and, and it's products and, of course, it's services. And That's services, the other thing. yeah. I mean, tourism, yeah. you know, is important, become much more important. Uh, education is crucial, as yeah. we discussed. So yeah. across the board, actually. Yeah. Also, it's important to look at, they, they do learn from us sometimes on institutional development. Yeah, sure. Uh, Indonesia's legal system is in, you know, very underdeveloped. Yeah. What didn't exist in a yeah. sense under Suharto. So that they look at our, you know, our, our reserve bank. Yeah, right. They look at our legal system. They look at things like our A Triple C. They've even looked at our federal state relationship. I don't well, know. Don't I don't know how much. Yes, I don't know how much they want to look at that. that. One. But, but they look at. Uh, but this is in a policy sense, not just yeah. in a business sense. Yeah. They look at institutions as well. Well, I think we should wind it up. But um, I've got two questions. One is. What if we are not careful about the, if you like, the personal relationships mm. with Indonesia? What would the consequences of that be? For example, if we didn't get on too well with um, France or Spain or, or something, they'd still trade with us. Mm. I mean, life would go on. We, you know, we mightn't be great mates. Does that matter particularly with Indonesia? Uh, well, it's, it's true that business will go on. If you think back to the mid-1980s when there was the so-called David Jenkins affair, when relations were put on hold after that article, City Morning Herald, oh, on Suharto's right. kids and so on. So this uh, is a, a, a journalist, mm, very critical... Former foreign editor of the City Morning Herald, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, that led to a freeze? In well, actually, it led to a freeze in one diplomatically, but business still did go on. So it's the point yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. But uh, to the extent that governments have a a role in shaping com perceptions, community mm, perceptions yeah. about a country, it, it would, would certainly be negative. For example, the student numbers, I mean, would they would fall away. They would mm. fall away. You know, a bit like in the way with India, it looked like it's yeah. going to be dangerous three years ago, but it hasn't been. Um, so there would be a perception problem. Uh, at the margin, when it came to regulatory decisions, Australian companies would yeah. miss out, the banks want to expand, yeah. they'd be held back, the mining sector and so and on. And in any event, mm. it's not all about trade and investment, is it? I mean, they're our nearest neighbour with yes. nearly 250 million yes. people. You'd think yes. that it's actually important yeah. to get on with your neighbours. And, and in a way, you know, we've, we've got to put ourselves in their shoes. They've got these four cabinet members who've spent quite long periods of time in Australia yeah. at the ANU and elsewhere. Where are the equivalents on our side? Yeah. You know, if you think about the sort of the ease of familiarity between, say, the, the, the British elite political and business and their German counterparts, you know, they, they, they deeply you know, mm. interlock. Yeah. We're not yet deeply yeah, yeah. interlock. Yeah. If there was one thing that you could change in the world or change in our relations with Indonesia, what would it be? The next generation, that's the crucial one. Both ways, uh, big time movements, uh, you know, for, for student exchanges. Mm. I think that builds the foundations yeah. for a much better informed society on both sides.
Al Hill, thank you very much for coming on in a MO Forum. Thanks for the invitation, yeah, Craig. I appreciate it. Mm. There, there are people who believe that the, the, the moon landing is a fake. There are still people who believe the Earth's flat. I mean, there's, you're never going to get uh, absolute uh, consensus. That's not how science works.